So good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, new MOA masterclass series on orthopedic oncology. And I request uh, first Dr. Ajit Shinde, the MOA president, to say a few words and initiate the proceedings. Over to you, Shinde, sir. Good evening, dear friends. Greeting from Maharashtra Orthopedic Association. I, Dr. Ajit Chinde, President of Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, welcome all of you to this MOA Masterclass series. And today's topic is Benign Bone Tumors, Part 1. As we all know, looking from per perspective of general orthopedic surgeons, any neoplastic bone, bony lesion, even it appearing benign clinical radiologically, is considered somewhat as a threat and they are usually reluctant to intervene or due to lack of knowledge, there is likely of mismanagement and this is not good scenario for our fraternity. I want to upgrade their knowledge and more friendly with these tumors and with this intention, we have decided to include bone tumors management as a topic for MOA Masterclass webinar series. And this is the first episode. Today we have experienced Dr. Yogesh Panchavak as a convener and brilliant panel of ortho onco surgeons headed by renowned Dr. Manish Agrawal, who has an eminent faculty in this field and consultant orthopedic surgeon PD Hinduja and Tata Cancer Hospital, Mumbai, to discuss the topic along with Dr. Ashish Gulia and Dr. Chetan and Dr. Prakash Nayak, who all will be presenting cases related to in important topic in benign pony lesion today. Apart from that, we have also our MOA members from Peri Peri presenting relevant cases to my best wishes for today's webinar. And now I hand over the proceeding to Dr. Panchavak, our convener. Thank you. Jai Hind, Jai Maharashtra, Jai Amoy. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thanks to Maharashtra Orthopedic Association and Ortho TV uh, for giving us this opportunity. And thanks to all our uh, elite uh, panelists who have agreed to spare their Sunday evening time for the next uh, four Sundays to be with us. The idea of this masterclass in bone tumors is going to be uh, sort of dividing the topic in four different series. Uh, the first of which is today, which is going to be dealing with uh, the common benign bone tumors that an orthopedic surgeon comes across in his uh, practice. And today we are going to cover the uh, simple bone cysts, the aneurysmal bone cysts, uh, osteoosteomas, osteoblastomas, and chondroblastomas. So our uh, eminent panelists are going to be covering each uh, uh, particular differential, each, each diagnosis separately, presenting their cases, and we will have a discussion uh, with the experts uh, in the panel. So to begin with, uh, the opening batsman will be Dr. Ashish Gulia, uh, who will be uh, covering unicameral bone cysts and uh, the way uh, we need to manage them ideally. Ashish, uh, over to you. Good evening, everyone, and thanks to Maharashtra Orthopedic Association to give us this opportunity to come on this platform uh, to discuss uh, benign bone tumors. Thanks to Dr. Ashok Sham for providing uh, the support and the platform for this, and Dr. Yogesh Panchpak, the convener, for inviting me to share what we know a bit about uh, unicameral bone cyst. So in next about 20 minutes, I will be showing you three to four cases and uh, with the panelists, I will be discussing uh, how best we can manage these different scenarios which we see in unicameral bone cyst. So greetings from Tata Memorial Hospital. And uh, so this is a, a typical radiograph of uh, uh, a kid which 
uh, who usually presents with a unicameral bone cyst. So let me start with Dr. Panchwag. Dr. Panchwag, can you please highlight the radiological features uh, of a unicameral bone cyst so that everybody can understand it, uh, it well? Yeah, typically the classical presentation, as in this particular case, is an immature skeleton and a very well-defined lytic centrally located lesion uh, in the uh, metaphyseal region or the epimetaphyseal region. And you sometimes may have that spurious feeling of multi-loculation, multiple loculations, typically, which is just because of the ridging on the endosteal surface. But yes, as we see, there is no extraceous extension. There is no ballooning out of the cortex. It's centrally located, very well-defined benign uh, lesion. Uh, patients typically present with uh, symptoms of pain or most of the times they would present to us with uh, some sort of an indirect or direct injury and having a pathological fracture through the, uh, uh, through the lesion. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Panchwag, we, uh, thanks for very nicely elaborating the radiology. I think it's very clear how these uh, expensile lesions, which are placed eccentrically, look in uh, a pediatric age group and humerus being the most common site. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Nayak, can you l let us know about a few differentials which you always keep in your mind whenever you have this uh, a a a any kid who has presented to you at this age? What will be your differentials when you see such an X-ray? So, essentially, in a pediatric age group, I'm looking at a skeletally immature skeleton. I'm looking at a benign lesion, and I'm looking at a cystic lesion. So the common, the first common differential in my mind when I'm looking at a cystic lesion will be an aneurysmal bone cyst. Other benign conditions uh, like giant cell tumor are extremely unusual in a skeletally immature individual because these lesions, especially UBC, come well demarcated. It's very clear that they are benign. Occasionally though, if the margins are unclear, in any cystic lesion, we must always consider a telangiectatic or other kind of osteosarcoma because we know that osteosarcoma can mimic any disease. But often with clear expansion, well demarcated lesion, usually we need not suspect a malignant lesion. So the primary two differentials are UBC, ABC. In our country, like osteosarcoma can mimic any lesion, Tuberculosis can also mimic any lesion, and I will always keep infection and tuberculosis at the back of my mind and look for further features to refute or accept that differential on an MRI. These are the common differentials that I would consider. Great, great. So that's what I have enumerated here, uh, which uh, all the differentials very well uh, uh, enumerated by Dr. Nayak that these lesions which, which causes expansion of the bone and at this age, ABC comes as the first differential diagnosis. And sometimes when you have fracture and you get uh, multiple septations or loculations, and these uh, sometimes uh, uh, atelangiectic osteosarcoma may be confused with this and, and infection and sometimes fibrous dysplasia, which may get some cystic changes can also uh, be the differentials uh, for uh, this kind of uh, cystic lesion. So now let me go to Dr. Anchan. And uh, Dr. Anchan, yeah. this is the yeah. first case which we'll be discussing after we basically discussed about uh, basics of UBC radiology. And right. so this 11 year old kid, he had a trivial fall and that's how he presented to us in the clinics. So right. what will be your thoughts looking at this X-ray, whether this fits into UBC or, or, or whatever differentials we discussed, are, are you thinking of any other things? And in that mm -hmm. way, what comes first and how will you plan the further uh, line of management for this kid? Right. See, first thing is uh, what I need to ask, uh, you know, the uh, child or the parents of the child is whether this patient or this, you know, kid had any symptoms before the injury whether he was complaining of any pain in that region in the few weeks or months prior to this injury, that, you know, is a, a sign of trouble for me that will indicate something more active than a simple bone cyst. Because typically the history with simple bone cysts is most of them generally don't have any history of any complaint. It's just a trivial injury following which, you know, this thing is discovered. 
the other thing that i want to ask is whether this child had a similar history in the past you know cyst after fracture can heal and the cyst can persist and this child can have recurrent you know fractures if there is a similar history in the past which was say a year ago two years ago that gives me more confidence in the possibility that this could be a persistent simple bone cyst now in so this those case, are the in this case this is the first uh, episode right 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 so that is something because, where i will be extremely careful with you know uh, labeling this into any particular diagnosis i would want to next do an mri of this child to see what is the nature of this particular lesion okay so let me come to dr panchwag dr panchwag do, do you feel that mri is essential in all the cases of ubc or in this case what is your take on it yeah my take is that mri if possible has to be done in these cases it is a useful tool because the x rays may sometimes be misleading maybe just one or two cases or in out of 100 may turn out to be something else but you would have done great disservice if you would have treated them directly as unicameral bone cyst and if they turned out to be otherwise so to have an idea of the matrix uh, and other characteristics of the lesion i think yes mri would be necessary in most of the lesions uh, as this okay agarwal sir any 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 point of difference or you agree with the, what uh, yogesh said agarwal sir okay i think uh, agarwal sir is not there so i'll i'll just move he's there he's there he's muted though i don't know anyway you proceed okay. okay so uh, i'll just go ahead so uh, that, that that was my main question yes agarwal sir is uh, is back agarwal sir i still can't hear him no he's still muted okay so that was my next question do we need any further imaging and i think uh, what dr yogesh panjwak has said he is is made it very clearly if you just had an incidental finding where you are not planning any further management where there are no you know any very some features and you are just planning to observe this kid you may hold on but if you are planning any further management and if 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 there's a fracture and and the imaging looks a bit suspicious it's always good to have an additional imaging or a three dimensional imaging and mri in this case in these cases are the investigation of choice where you do further mri and further characterize the lesion and then you take the call okay so uh, dr nayak these are the mri pictures so if you can go back to the uh, coronal images yeah uh, so the images i am keen to look at are uh, intrinsic t1 t2 and post contrast images these seem like post contrast images the coronal images where i am looking at a homogeneous cystic cavity i am looking at multiple fluid fluid levels i am looking at some hemorrhagic component that has sedimented i see uniform cystic cavity the fallen fragment is clearly visible i do not see peri lesional edema that becomes very important for me when i am trying to differentiate from a benign and a very aggressive or a malignant lesion the peri lesional edema is not very prominent on these images the images seem the lesion seems very well demarcated i do not see any uh, progression beyond the growth plate the growth plate seems to have limited the lesion very well Uh, so again this reinforces what my uh, judgment was on the x ray which is i'm looking at a uni locular lesion in the metaphysis with clear fluid some hemorrhagic sediment of fallen fragment all very classical features of a unicameral bone cyst also i'm not looking at any solid component which i would particularly want to look at on the post contrast image just because if there is any solid component then the differential of unicameral bone cyst uh, is excluded so considering this uh, i am reinforcing the judgment i made on the x ray over thanks 
Thanks, Dr. Nayak. And uh, Dr. Nayak very nicely elaborated what you need to look in the MRI. And though this MRI was done outside, so I had limited cuts, but looking at the MRI, this, the thought process was same that the, the features which we are looking in the MRI in both coronal and the axial cuts, uh, there's hardly any edema in the surrounding bone and, and, uh, and, and uh, you have the uh, fallen fragment sign, which is pretty visible there. It, because of the fracture, there's a bit of edema in the soft tissues and you can see the fracture very clearly. And there is no extortious soft, soft tissue component, this expansion of the bone. Looking at all these features, we thought of uh, observing these patients. And so when we go to the treatment, so let me ask this question to uh, Dr. Panchwag. Dr. Panchwag, whenever you are trying to treat any unicameral bone cyst, what will be your aim of the treatment, whether it is conservative, whether it is uh, percutaneous or, or it's uh, um, a surgical management, what actually we are trying to achieve? No, basically, the aim of treatment is to achieve a good healing within that uh, uh, cavity, within the lesion. Uh, sometimes with a pathological fracture as this in this particular case, you may expect the lesion to heal up along with the fracture healing, but that does not occur in all the cases. But yes, my next line of treatment probably would be an intralesional uh, installation for which I need a intact uh, cavity with uh, a good uh, boundary wall. So, and that is not going to be possible in this particular case. So, to begin with a pathological fracture in a simple cyst, simple bone cyst, yes, I would be conserving it to begin with, see what happens, how the fracture heals and how the lesion responds to the fracture healing uh, at about say six weeks down the line and then take my uh, decision later on. Okay, so essentially the line of management can be conservative, minimally invasive or, or the invasive surgeries. And what we are looking at is we want to heal the cystic lesion and while it's healing, there is thickness of the cortices which appear. The bone gain its strength back, and and the entire cavity is 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 ossified. So uh, as Dr. Panchwag also mentioned, and I was saying, so we have different line of management uh, uh, options available, right from. Uh, conservative management and going into minimal invasive, which may involve steroid injection, bone marrow injections, demolized bone matrix injections or candidated screws. And then we can have uh, open surgical procedures which require curatized bone grafting or, or doing intramedullary uh, nailing procedures for these patients. So this patient uh, was treated with uh, conservative management. This is the radiograph at uh, four months. Uh, after uh, after giving a trial of conservative management, it healed pretty well. So, uh, Dr. Chetan, yeah. would, you, would you go with the same line of management or would you treat it any differently? Dr. Yogesh no. wanted to treat the same way. I want your opinion as well. I would agree with Yogesh. The, okay. Initially, the treatment will be conservative uh, till the fracture heals. And then I will watch the cyst, whether it is you know resolving or whether it is persisting. And secondly, take up this patient for, you know, any sort of intervention to deal with the cyst. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And the other thing is, uh, you know, it is also important to, you know, decide on your line of treatment based on the location of the cyst. If it is in the lower limb, like in the proximal femur, okay. you know, I would be more aggressive with my management as compared to where, you know, it is in this particular case in a non-weight bearing bone. Sure. Sure. We'll come to that. So this is this. 36 months follow-up of this patient and uh, at, even at this follow-up he was completely asymptomatic he was he had regained his sports activities and he was doing pretty well so we just treated him conservatively and 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 he was doing pretty okay so now quickly let's go to the second case 16 year old uh, male who had uh, uh, presented to us with pain in his right arm not the shoulder and patient very characteristically like uh, how Dr. Chetan Anchan wanted to ask the history of previous injury or fracture. He gave the history of proximal humerus fracture, which healed by itself with conservative management two years back. And this is the x-ray at presentation. So I think I'll start with Dr. Anchan uh, uh, only that yeah. Dr. Anchan, you see the, this kind of lesion and, yeah. and with that history. So what is yeah. your thought process? 
with such a history you know it is fairly straightforward for me to come to the conclusion that this is a persistent simple bone cyst which has you know was primarily earlier in the metaphyseal area with the growth of the child it has migrated into the diaphysis okay of course i will go back into the previous you know radiology of this uh, patient and see whether you know it sort of corroborates my you know suspicion mm mm-hmm. okay so actually this patient came to me and he said that his friend has hit him on the arm he gave a very typical history he said i had absolutely no problems i had this small bulge on my arm since quite some time but he has right. hit me on this arm and after he has hit me i i've got mild pain i don't take any analgesics i can do all the activities even above head so how will you go ahead so this you know when you see on this x ray clearly you know this is uh, a cyst which i am worried that it will at some point you know risk a fracture so this will certainly need management even though i am still confident that this is a simple bone cyst i would still want to do an mri and you know document it with uh, additional imaging okay dr uh, panchwag yeah i agree with chetan and uh, i would image this and just uh, you know to see uh, what's been happening inside within the cyst this is also a 16 years old male he's going to be very active mid third of the humerus we are expecting uh, quite a few uh, stresses on this particular area at a later date as well yeah. so whatever we decide to do we need, we need to be a bit uh, more definitive in uh, planning now do you really want to treat him or you want to observe him that was my question actually see this is a second fracture he is complaining of pain even though it was after a after a trauma and that particular appearance it you know it looks as if he is at a higher risk of fracturing at a later date as well okay so i would he, gi- i would give him the option of you know surgical treatment of course it is up to the patient then to decide whether he wants to because this is not a limb threatening lesion or a life threatening lesion it is on the only risk is that it risks a fracture so if he is willing to be careful and he is willing to take a risk with a fracture then it is up to the patient okay. but i will make a suggestion that he will probably benefit with surgical treatment okay dr nayak so i agree the only thing uh, that uh, makes me reassured that he did not have pain before the fracture in the first instance so yeah. i'm not worried about something more aggressive uh if he has presented with pain at this instance uh, i am already worried that this is an impending fracture mm-hmm. but if this was an incidental pick up with a bump and he is asymptomatic i am more willing to hold on since he is 16 and if he is presented with pain i without a doubt will go ahead with actual imaging and take my call based on that actual imaging okay. i think we do have dr manish agarwal also who's joined in uh, let's Agarwal's ask him what is agarwal sir is back yeah so you know i i am now an old man <laughs> and i don't always agree with what you guys said and and what i have learned especially when i'm talking to an audience of orthopedic surgeons one thing is never assume anything and i have seen enough number of lesions which have been assumed to be a a, a simple bone cyst after which uh, all kinds of surgery have been done and and it has not turned out to be a simple bone cyst almost all orthopedic surgeons uh, tend to assume that a lytic lesion is a simple bone cyst because they probably not seen the other lesion so what comes in from memory is an is a simple bone cyst so i think it is very important that you get imaging done and if you are not sure of what the lesion is you must be very confident it's a simple bone cyst before you try to treat it as a simple bone cyst the second thing is that i am very very conservative about treating a simple bone cyst in the upper limb in the humerus with surgery so i think unless and until the patient demands that they need surgery i i would probably still stick with the conservative treatment it works almost 90% of the time in my experience thank you sir yeah so, but conservative as in you mean to say uh, uh, intralesional treatment or you are talking yes. about surgical intervention no so it's intralesional it's going to be a needle scraping of the yeah. wall basically what you are trying to do is to traumatize the wall the fracture already does that mm-hmm. but in addition you can traumatize the wall the advantage is you also get material for pathology you can 100% confirm that this is not anything but a simple bone cyst and you have no chance of this being some other tumor 
like I told you that I have seen enough number of telangiectatic osteosarcomas, uh, plain osteosarcomas, even e wings, sometimes benign fibrous histiocytomas being treated as a simple bone cyst and, and they haven't turned out to be so. Now we have, it is very important to differentiate between a simple bone cyst and an aneurysmal bone cyst because a fracture in an aneurysmal bone cyst does not heal as predictably as it heals with a simple bone cyst. So this is something to be kept in mind. Okay, now uh, if, if the cyst has had previous fractures, it can become multi-loculated and differentiating between a simple bone cyst and an aneurysmal bone cyst may not be very easy. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. So my line of thought was that this kid who was playing very actively and had this bump since quite some time without any pain and, and, and a friend hit him, I actually thought of observing it and uh, I observed it and this was his x-ray at four months. Uh, there was a, one more x-ray at six weeks which showed no increase in the size of the swelling. And this x-ray at four months showed some sort of uh, filling of the cystic cavity. And uh, I was actually pretty pleased with it. And this was his x-ray at, at six months. So Dr. Anjan, what do you say? This yeah. work? Yeah, it looks like, definitely. It looks okay. good. OK. Dr. Panchwag? Yeah, I agree. No need of doing any intervention yes. from this particular x-ray. Okay, and actually, uh, Dr. Nayak already said that you know if if such a history is there, he would observe. So I'm sure Dr. Nayak will also be happy with the same result. Yeah, but I have a quick, I have a question. Uh, 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 Iji, so you're saying you be, you did not choose to even do an actual imaging? No, we did not do any actual imaging because his history was very clear. He said I have had this bump since past one and a half two years, and I was playing and I was involved in a sort of. Uh, a small fight in the school and my friend hit me. And even after that, uh, my pain is okay. But because my parents have taken me to an orthopedic surgeon, he did x-ray and we found this incidentally. So that was the history which uh, which was given. So I observed yeah, him if, at that point. Yeah, if, 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 I'm, if I'm honest to myself, I would have probably erred on the side of doing an imaging because the trabeculation worried me a bit. Uh, but that's the only thing different that perhaps I would have done. Actually, for me, the clincher was that he had a fracture two years back, which was, which he said he it was near the shoulder and patient again having the same fracture after two years and the swelling like this. I think that history was very important for me to observe him. Agarwal, sir. Okay. Uh, Ashish, I don't agree on this again. Okay, sir. I have recently seen a patient who looked exactly like this. Mm -hmm. It turned out to be a chondroid lesion, surprisingly, and it had multiple fractures and it had been going on for a period of eight years, all these things. So I think when, I'm, when I give some guidelines for a general orthopedic surgeon, I will not tell them to treat it only on the basis of an x-ray. I think you are much safer doing the actual imaging because in case you have missed out on something, the onus is not on you. If, if you don't do the imaging and the patient is willing to get the imaging done and you miss something, then I think you become liable. So I think you have to be a little careful. It is rare that you may miss it. I think most of us are going to be correct on this situation 95% of the time or more. But I still think that a good rule to follow is that please get all the imaging done. Be very certain of the diagnosis before you decide to proceed with treatment. We know that tumors are treacherous. We know that you can't predict and you can never make a complete 100% rule. So observing him over a period of six weeks without MRI, do you feel that is wrong? And where he shows healing? Yes. I'm not I, doing any biopsy. I'm not doing any curettage. No, but you don't lose anything by getting an MRI done simply because you know a little more about the lesion. First thing is that if I have never seen the imaging before of this particular patient, it will assure me that this is a cystic lesion and it is not something solid. Again, one thing to remember in India, we do come across cystic tuberculosis and, and sometimes you may make a mistake and I have made that mistake once and Yogesh will know that case, he's, he's presented that case also. Yeah. So I, I think I, I would think that an MRI is, is an absolute must if it has never been imaged before. I'm not going to assume anything to be a unicameral bone cyst unless I have proof of it. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, sure. So go ahead. There, there is a difference of opinion, but I think if I have a, I, if I have a clear history which is going on on for, since two years, I don't mind waiting. At least in my hand, I'm not sure about others. So well, actually, if you are working in Tata Memorial, you have some cover. People don't easily sue Tata Memorial Hospital. Then it's not about suing. But if, for is people, surgeons who are practicing two years history, then I, I, I think. If if somebody's uh, the history of our patients, Ashish is completely unreliable. Again, uh, take it from me. After twenty years of uh, looking at it, sure, sir. But I think in my practice, I won't uh, investigate each and every UBC which I I suspect. But yeah, well, if the if the patient says that they can't afford it and they don't want to do it, then it is a different matter. But I I think as a rule, otherwise I would do it. Anyway, that's that's yeah. So, twenty-five minutes uh, into the uh, series, so I think probably. Uh, you want me to uh, stop here? I can stop. No, here. you can just quickly cover another case if you have, uh, if you if you want to. Okay. Before we move on to Chetan. I think it is a good idea, Ashish. If you can just sum up the general principles for everybody. So this happened at eighteen months. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So this happened at eighteen months. Same patients. Your thought, Doctor Anjan? Wow. I mean, this shows that you know the stage is again relapsing. I just is, go back. Yeah. This is at four months. Yeah. Six months. Yeah. Twelve months. Yeah. Eighteen months. Yeah. What looked like it was resolving now again shows it shows some signs of activity, which is certainly a very worrying, you know, sign for me. I wonder whether this is, you know, uh, just a simple bone cyst or whether there is more to it. I certainly want advanced imaging now, actual imaging. Okay. So that's what we did. So these are a few MRI pictures for you, which right. look. Pretty similar to what Doctor uh, Nayak had elaborated. Described, yeah. UBC, right. and uh, as Doctor Agarwal also said, even if even if we have little bit of suspicion, we do this imaging, and we went ahead. Um, so I'll just skip the literature a bit, and uh, I'll I think I'll quickly go to what we did, and uh, we did a uh, curopsy. we did a biopsy from the uh, lesion wall and we injected a steroid injection because we thought this now this cyst is increasing back again and we again proved that uh, there is no malignancy in the lesion and uh, this is how uh, we dealt with this relapse in a uh, already healed ubc case which we had seen uh, any any different line of management any of the panelists you would have taken yogesh well i uh, we have a final x ray uh, after this particular intervention yes 3 months post steroid okay all right so basically one, the, one message which i am going to give it it is not healed till it is healed yeah i would i would watch it very closely and now since he's nearing his skeletal maturity i would probably sort of think of if if any other incidents occurs in the future i would my my threshold of intervention probably will be a little bit uh, lower yeah so at least in this case there was some uh, semblance that the cyst is not gone completely now i have seen two children where the cyst is completely gone there is absolutely no lysis at all and they have recurred after 4 years yeah this was also a, a bit like that sir this so, but here at least there is some lysis in the cavity i i'll show you the x rays where it is completely healed i mean where you can say with 100% confidence that there is nothing now remaining in the medulla yeah so but they have come back and that's the reason why today international uh, guidelines are that it is it is a good idea to follow them up for at least 5 years with at least an annual x ray Okay. Don't let them just be without without any observation. And I recently saw him few months back, and he's again started showing this lytic lesion on the lateral side. Very surprising. So now, Doctor Panchwag, how will you manage? Yeah, this is this is all that he's got, and any yes. symptoms? Not no symptoms at all. No symptoms. I would. 
I would keep on observing him, but at the slightest uh, sort of uh, indication that the cyst is growing, I would probably uh, intervene. That's what we have thought. We have called him. Uh, so that was, he's increased again. And we again, uh, we offered him surgery then after, uh, after this uh, uh, recurrence. So, so what surgery now? Uh, curettage. Uh, Are Ashish? you purposefully saying that? Ashish? Yeah. If you read the biopsy report yeah. of this particular patient, it was mentioned that this is a giant cell rich lesion. Yes, we discussed it and they said mm. this is definitely not biopsy and because it was treated earlier, it can appear that way. Okay. Yeah. So quickly just showing one more case, nine-year-old kid who had this lesion in the proximal femur, uh, though AP x-ray looks decent, but on the lateral x-ray, you can see a hairline crack. Dr. Nayak, how will you uh, manage this case? So my threshold for intervention in the proximal femur and in the neck of femur uh, is very low because of the associated morbidity with the risk of fracture. Here there already is a fracture that I can see on the uh, lateral x-ray. Uh, so in this case, um, my threshold to go in at least prophylactically fix this with a, a pediatric DHS is very low. And while I am attempting to do that, uh, I will opt to scrape the walls uh, and pack it with morphalized graft. Okay. Dr. Uh, Anchan? Uh, so these I are would... the MRI pictures. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Of course, this was assuming we are dealing with... Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just cutting short the time there because... Right, we right, 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 right. So it, it looks it, like it, a simple bone cyst. So it's a again, single... uh, for hmm. the benefits of all the attendees, this patient was imaged properly, MRI was done, we did a biopsy of the lesion, proved it that it is unicameral bone cyst, and then after that only we have done any sort of intervention which we want to do. What will you do? You agree with Dr. Nayak? I would prefer to still do a conservative procedure like a percutaneous, you know, a scraping of the wall with steroid injection and protect the patient in some sort of splint or a spica. And you know, follow it up. Dr. Panchwag? Ashish, I think I'm afraid uh, for the, in the interest of time, we will have to sort of quickly conclude and move no, on. No, these are the uh, last questions. Yeah. And I can, okay, fine. If, if you want me to stop, I can stop here. No, not a problem. Oh, don't stop. Just finish off this case. And then yes, yes. I, I, I will just cut down the discussion part, I mean. Okay, fine. So we essentially went ahead. And this case is courtesy Dr. Mandeep Shah uh, from uh, uh, Ahmedabad. Uh, I have I have not operated much of UBC, so I I borrowed this case from him, and this is and this is what he, he did, and it healed pretty well. But as as a principle of management, I agree with him because in lower limb, especially in this area, peritrochanteric area, and with that hairline fracture, it's it's good to stabilize it and just put in some graft. They heal pretty well, and they do pretty good, and you can you can mobilize them pretty easily. So I think I'll just. I'll just end here. And this is the algorithm which we follow. I think uh, the um, delegates can have a look at this. And uh, this is summarize how I treat uh, unicameral bone cyst if they present to me. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gulia. And uh, we will quickly move on to Dr. Chetan Anchan, who will be presenting his cases. Chetan, over to you. You can start. Yeah, sharing yeah, this. yeah. I will just share my screen. Can you see me, my slides? Yeah, 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 that's, it's seen. Yeah, let me just go to presentation. Huh. Oh, what happened? My mouse. You can go to slideshow and- uh... Yeah, I am trying, but my mouse suddenly. Yeah. Uh, 
I can't see my mouse. It just doesn't come out of. Just a minute. Is there a keyboard shortcut for that? Yogesh? Try. Uh, it's different for different uh, uh, keyboards. Uh, uh. You can just check on the check on the function keys on the top of your keyboard. You will see an it icon. It's not for... happening. Just unshare and share again. Sometimes that works. No, my mouse only uh, you know is sort of parallel. Frozen. It's, huh, frozen. Yeah, just unshare and share again. But how do Let I unshare? Let me share for you. Try yeah, escape. yeah. Try escape. Okay, yeah. Now I can use my mouse again. Yeah. Try escape. Yeah. Share screen. Yeah, can you see that? Yeah, you are on. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, we are on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a moment. Just yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go. Thank you, Emui, and thank you, Yogesh. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Sham, for this opportunity to present uh, aneurysmal bones as a part of this Emui masterclass. I'll be speaking on aneurysmal bones. So this will be basically a case-based uh, discussion. So here we go. This is the first case. It's a 14-year-old girl who came with vague pain around the knee, no other complaints, and no relevant past history. So an X-ray was done, and this is what it showed. Uh, Ashish, would you yes opine on what do you think this X-ray shows? So uh, we've got AP and lateral views of uh, of this kid with immature skeleton, where I see a lesion which is essentially located in the in the metaphyseal lesion, going right up to the um, epiphysis of the proximal tibia. Uh, 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 I'm not sure about AP X. It's not very clear on my uh, screen, but on, on on the lateral X-ray, I can see that the lesion ends at a particular level. Uh, which yeah. I can mark it very nicely. So I, I will put it as a narrow zone of transition. There's expansion of the bone. There is thinning of the cortices on both the sides. And uh, given this age and the location, uh, probably we are dealing with uh, primary neoplastic uh, uh, etiology of the bone and probably benign. This is what I can say from the x-ray. Okay. Yogesh, any differentials? Well, yes. I mean, if you are covering ABCs, but I would have <laughs> thought of an uh, unicameral bones to begin with if you would have asked my top differential. But right. UBCs, ABCs, uh, chondromyxoid fibroma, those would remain my uh, differential diagnosis just based on the X-ray. Right, yeah. right. Anybody else has any yes, other opinion? But chondromyxoid fibroma, I won't push it that hard because the cortices are really thinned out and expansion of the bone. But yes, cystic lesions of the bone benign cystic lesions will be my differentials. Right. Anybody else has anything more to offer? I have one rule for everybody. Yes, sir. That in a in a 10 to 20 year old age group, yes. do not assume anything is benign till you have proven it. Right. Absolutely. You may suspect it, you may keep it higher on your differential diagnosis, right. but do not at any time assume that this lesion cannot be malignant. You've seen osteosarcomas which have looked exactly like this. Right, absolutely. You can't assume anything. That is the rule of thumb. So I'll just quickly move to uh, the next imaging. An MRI was done for this uh, girl. And that is what it shows. I'll quickly run through the MRI images. So there is a fluid fluid level in this. Okay, Prakash, what do you think about the MRI findings? Prakash, am I audible? Yeah, you are. I think Prakash. I lost some audio. I lost some audio. I'm back now, though. Sorry. For okay, okay. Question. I missed your question. Yeah, Prakash, uh, what do you think about the MRI findings in this?
case. So, 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 so it's interesting. Uh, I again yeah. uh, go back to my basic principles. So I'm looking at a metafacial lesion. I think it's very well demarcated. I yeah. see focal indentations along the growth plate, but nothing that's crossing the growth plate. I do yeah. not see any perilesional edema. I right. do not see any focal cortical breakthrough. I do not see any soft tissue component. Uh, and I'm looking at a benign lesion for sure. I would next like to go on to the actual sections to further characterize what sort of fluid exists within this lesion. I see one big of fluid level. I do not see multiple fluid fluid levels, at least on uh, what's projecting on my screen. Right. But I do see one big uh, sedimented yeah, fluid yeah, level. Yeah, we can so, see it here. Uh, so, so I agree. I agree with these differentials of uh, keeping uh, a benign cystic lesion high up on my differential list. Okay. So what is happened there a, is, is there a multi, multiple, are there any multiple localizations, localizations near the I tibial deposit? Mm, here, somewhere here? Near the tibial deposit. I have to down, imagine like hard, it's it like one big homogeneous cavity. Yeah, here? If you just see the top row, the top row, hmm. axial crust. Yeah, there, you so there's a, one a, big, there's a one big horizontal, and and you yeah. have more uh, 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 on the upper half as well. Yeah, gray patches here, yes. but you can't really you know make out what those are. Not classical fluid fluid levels. Yeah, but there is one single large fluid fluid level in this case. Anyway, what happened is more a week later, she stumbled and you know fractured at home. So anything you know interesting in this X-ray? I mean, if this patient had come to you with just with this X-ray, Yogesh, what would I have thought of this? Well, I am not very sure if I would call it as a single fallen fragment sign. I mm. typically get to see maybe two or three uh, fallen fragments over there, so it's it's a bit confusing. I agree, not yeah. exactly fitting into. You know. I mean, your gut feeling is what about this? What is your gut feeling? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, still think of this to be an uh, unicameral bone cyst, but no, I'm not very sure. Okay. So exactly as I thought, you know, for me, this was by all means a simple bone cyst, you know, from all the findings that I had, the clinical history, the pre-fracture x-ray, the MRI findings, and this x-ray that looks, you know, typically the kind that you see in a fractured unicameral bone cyst. So I suspected simple bone cyst of bone. Uh, so what I did was a percutaneous scraping, primarily for a biopsy. And at the same time, I injected steroid into it and sent the tissue for histopath. So histopath report was very clear. This is a giant cell rich lesion consistent with an aneurysmal bone cyst. And this is Dr. Borges' report. And uh, I did discuss with them. And they were very clear that the tissue findings are of a giant aneurysmal bone cyst. Chetan, a quick question. What specific care did you take to avoid going through the fracture site? Through the fracture site? Avoid, I, I meant avoid doing the biopsy through the fracture site. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My plan. needle entry point was far away from the cyst. This is a very large cavity. So, you know, you get a lot of room to play around with. So, that is what happened. So, I was quite taken aback by this report. And since, you know, we know it is an ABC and I had injected steroid in this, which generally we don't really use to, you know, deal with an ABC. Chetan, I'm going to come in here. I don't agree yes, sir. with pathology. Okay. And this is not the first time I don't agree. <laughs> first time, I think the clinician knows better. This is a UBC. This is not an ABC. You've got blood because of the fracture. Even right. if you have a crack fracture, you do get blood into it. And the pathologist has no way of telling. Unless right. you see that typical, what they call as the blue osteoid. Hmm. Which, which is seen in ABC, which is, it is very difficult to tell. And I think the hallmark of diagnosis of an ABC is not a single cavity, but you right. have multiple loculations. Right, right. So I, I don't think even if you did a curopsy or if you just injected a steroid, uh, it's going to change the healing. It's still going to heal. Okay. So I, I, I would not treat this or I would not consider this as an ABC because here 
i don't yeah. think the pathologist can be accurate all the time okay interesting so that's what happened uh, and just to just to weigh in uh, there's been a quick point here uh, yeah. some something that uh, in hopefully in the coming 6 months or a year would be uniformly available at least that uh, a tmh and perhaps the rest of uh, india as well uh, in hmm. 70% of these primary aneurysmal bones is the pathologists now will in future routinely do uh, a usp6 uh, ihc Uh, which okay. is positive in seventy percent of primary aneurysmal bone cysts. It is not positive ever in a secondary aneurysmal bone cyst. And wow. oftentimes in these edge cases where the pathologist is unsure for whatever reason, uh, mm. we will have a robust marker to tell us what it is. Just something okay. to add. That will be great. That will be great. It's news for us too. So three months post procedure, pain had reduced. Patient was walking, weight bearing, and that is the X-ray. Three months after the steroid injection, so I was pretty pleased with this. So, but anyway, we decided to follow her up, knowing that you know this is the comparison between our July X-ray and the October X-ray, and it looks you know sort of the fracture has certainly healed. The bone looks better than before. So in November, you know I repeated the X-ray, and now if you compare between the October and November X-ray. i thought it looked a bit worse than what it was so we repeated an mri so the mri findings were like this yeah you can Prakash? see multiple fluid fluid levels now yeah there. so yes i agree with uh, what dr panchwag said in hindsight it always seems like you will like see multiple smarter. levels when you have a fracture Even in a UBC, exactly. you can see multiple fluid. Exactly. Yeah, but if Chetan, if you go back to the to the X-ray, you will see that there is a uh, you know cortical expansion. There is yes. a bit of a soft tissue extension. Maybe this there. is what got yeah. me worried. Yeah. Exactly. This is what got me worried here. But what? So, but 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 I'd say one thing: it still does prima facie look like a benign lesion. Would you agree with that? Yes, it has yeah. got a. the clinical benign. behavior has been benign yes so these are the so there is a breach of the cortex now you know in maybe because of the whole fracture i don't know but it got me worried so we so that was the mri report which says this uh, sorry this represents simple bone cyst with interregional hemorrhage or an aneurysmal bone cyst so we waited for another month and that was the x ray findings in december so now if we compare the october x ray and the december x ray clearly you know this is looking much worse and now her pain returned and she was unable to walk again yeah this is this is aggressively behaving aggressively though do still you think probably yeah no no but what i am asking is do you expect this kind of finding in a simple bone cyst no i wouldn't so that's what you know what to do now get a fresh imaging done actual sections actual imaging we just did did we one second let me just go we just did here you know that was just a month ago okay all right the what we saw all these images sorry you saw that no where we yeah, saw yeah, multiple yeah, fluid, fluid yeah. levels so yeah. that was just a month back right yeah yeah just a month ago okay my pc is a bit slow sorry let me just come back we'll have to keep a watch on the clock chetan yeah yeah i know but my pc is not rolling clearly ha huh? you know see either i overshoot or i undershoot anyway so this is the december x ray so what now the issue was what to do so i consulted the patient see frustrating Consult the patient. Give them options of extended curettage with reconstruction, with bone graft and plating, or sclerotherapy, because of 
you know the pros and cons of each i don't want to go into the details of that so we decided to go for sclerotherapy a quick word regarding sclerotherapy chetan can you just tell the audience what do you mean by why, that why don't do you uh, ashish yes yeah please can you tell us about sclerotherapy okay so uh, i was just keeping mum but if, to be honest uh, and the, that's why i was trying to show on the first uh, you know the top images i i thought i thought that i saw a uh, multiple fluid fluid levels there was one big one and we have seen multiple times that you can that was my feeling as well yes that was yeah, my feeling and, as well and a few small ones as well and uh, uh, so uh, maybe would have treated like abc in in this patient if we would have known that this is abc we would have treated with sclerotherapy usually we treat with the polydocanol uh, percutaneous injections and uh, we measure the size of the lesion the maximum dose we give about is 6 cc not more than that though there's a bit of controversy about uh, how much is the maximum quantity we can give but we give maximum 6 the bigger lesions in the proximal humerus or the or the lesions in the pelvis they they may require multiple settings and uh, we right. just uh, we just reviewed our data uh, about Forty-seven uh, to forty-eight percent of the lesions they they usually heal with single injections. We have uh, repeated uh, uh, injections maximum up to five or six times, and uh, if whenever we evaluate these patients after eight weeks, we uh, assess them clinically and radiologically. If we feel that both uh, on both the parameters, the patients are not healing and the lesion is increasing and symptoms are increasing. we must reinsure that we are dealing with aneurysmal bone cysts and not with any other lesions which may look similar on radiology and pathology like giant cell tumors or rarely telangiectic osteosarcoma if some uh, if if a C, uh, if a, a trained pathologist have not reviewed all, all the slides carefully uh, thank you ashish thank you So, so we did a percutaneous scraping and fluorescent injection, and uh, we sent tissue again for histopath, and again the report was consistent with cellular and visible bone cysts. Oh my PC! So in Jan, uh, after six weeks, if you compare, you know the X-ray, the bone definitely looked better. We again repeated the uh, fluorescent. Six weeks after the first injection, and in March 2020, that was her X-ray. This is her last X-ray because after that, because of the lockdown, she was unable to follow up. But I just checked with her yesterday. She is walking around fine. She is absolutely fine. I asked her to do a fresh X-ray. I don't know what is the situation as of today. But on this X-ray, it certainly looked like it has responded to the intralesional sclerosin injection. Any comments? No, it looks good. It looks great yeah, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully, again, she will follow the same category whether she is healed with a single injection. Yeah, uh, no, she had two injections. Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I don't know what is the status as of now. Let's quickly move on to the next case. One little uh, details for clarification. Season, would yeah. you prefer to do all of them a GA tourniquet? I Or think we do. The officer as do we do all your sclerotherapy? Under general anesthesia with a tourniquet, would you do yes. it in the office under local? No, 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 no. I always do it in the operation theater under proper anesthesia under tourniquet because the scraping procedure is is not just about just injecting something. You have to do a lot of scraping of the walls, which is a fairly long procedure, and uh, I'm sure the patient will be uncomfortable without proper anesthesia. Yeah, I just wanted to reinforce that. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Absolutely, absolutely. So this is the next case. an asymptomatic 9 year old boy who had a trivial injury while playing had a pathological fracture of the proximal humerus uh, my god sorry so that was his x ray at presentation yogesh what do you think of this x ray chetan uh, chetan i think we'll have to sort of take this case uh, Uh, run through it discussion yeah and finish it off you can okay. just go on you can just go yeah on. yeah 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 okay so anyway it was thought of as a simple bone cyst again because of the fallen fragment sign and all those features and uh, this child was conserved my pc is 
was assumed to be a simple bone cyst treated conservatively in an arm sling and it was followed up with monthly x-rays and over a period of time my god yaar yeah. this cyst the fracture healed sorry you can just tell us from i don't know for at what duration this yeah. was yeah yeah over a period of a couple of weeks i mean uh, a couple of months months right yeah 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 unfortunately yeah, this pc is just hanging no issues i am unable to you know uh, time my scrolling at all you can use the um... use the keyboard instead of the keyboard mouse keyboard i am using yeah so anyway see that's what happened you know over a period of time so around 8 weeks that was what the x-ray looked like so pain settled in a couple of weeks fracture apparently healed in another couple of weeks I don't know where I'm going. Anyway. Anyway, Shetan, I think you had a exp- very aggressive expansive lesion. Yeah, the aggressive expansive lesion. Fluid levels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. this was an uh, an aneurysmal bone cyst. Yeah. And how did you treat it further? Yeah. So. <laughs> I'm so sorry for this. I, I saw your last X-ray as well, so I know how you have treated it. Oh my God. I'm really sorry. what is the issue chetan sir my computer is just uh, you know not scrolling adequately so first i did a percutaneous scraping and uh, poly, you know sclerosin injection but in 6 weeks time he came back like this what would you do at this age at this time repeat the sclerosin injection those are the mri findings i will definitely repeat the biopsy will have a very high suspicion of uh, Uh, telangiectic osteosarcoma in this case right we reviewed the histopath uh, they were absolutely clear that this is a benign you know okay uh, then i will bone cyst then i will augment it with angioembolization okay so we have, here we have hmm. in in the sclerotherapy series we have had two or three uh, proximal uh, humerus lesions which were just not healing and i okay. think in one of the cases uh, she she saw dr agrawal as well and he he did angioembolization and she healed pretty well we have mm-hmm. also augmented a few refractory lesions with that way and mm. uh, looking at the whole data we had about nine refractory lesions which we have treated in different way but with with most of them except for the spine we have uh, we have put angioembolization in, in in one case of spine i have added denosumab as well okay so here you know we discussed with the family and they refused sclerotherapy because you know it clearly didn't work the first time and we were also very reluctant to offer them the same procedure where we were also you know extremely worried about the presentation of this patient so what we did was we did a curettage with the fibula graft uh, you know uh, reconstruction along with a tense nail to support the graft it's just not rolling man so so that's what you know it looked like eventually it healed very well that is uh, you know last x ray and uh, he got huge beautiful function at the shoulder i okay. think uh, yogesh my time must be up 
Yeah, yeah. I so guess, we are yeah. pretty short on time. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Jethan. That was very interesting. Uh, I'm we'll really sorry. To... No, no issues. No issues. Uh, you did your best. Uh, we'll move yeah. on to Professor Manish Agarwal's uh, presentation. Uh, Agarwal, sir, over to you. Agarwal, sir. Share the screen. So I think uh, let's shorten it because time is short. I think this is one of the commonest lesions uh, seen by most orthopedic surgeons. Most of them know how to pick it up and the signs are quite classic. So this is, this is one example of uh, where things can be quite classic and you can actually see that uh, there is a lytic lesion. It's not easy to appreciate uh, on this X-ray, on the AP X-ray, but if you see the lateral X-ray, you can appreciate that lytic lesion and you can see a periosteal reaction, which is a solid periosteal reaction. So we know that this looks like something which is uh, benign. The MR always looks a lot more dangerous than what uh, the lesion actually is because the osteoid osteoma causes a lot of inflammatory uh, swelling. And therefore you see a lot of marrow edema, which can actually confuse uh, the things and make you feel that this is something aggressive. It can look like infection. You may not be able to see the nidus well because the cortical bone is not uh, uh, very well seen on uh, MRI. But a CT scan generally always picks up the nidus. And once you've picked up the nidus, I think it's a, you just have to send it to your interventional radiologist for a radio frequency ablation. So I think we'll just skip discussing anything on this part. This is the fairly typical osteoid osteoma. And the classic sign, actually, you pick up an osteoid osteoma from the history itself when the child or the parents tell you that uh, they wake up in the middle of the night with pain and you just give them a simple uh, anti-inflammatory. It could be an IBJ sick or it could be a paracetamol and they get good relief of pain. Um, aspirin has been overstated. I have found that most of our patients don't have aspirin at home to give to children. So, so the pain relief, dramatic pain relief with aspirin is more theoretical than practical. I think as far as we are concerned, it's it's the ibuprofen which, which gives them just magical pain relief and the child goes off to sleep. And then he seems to be perfectly fine the next day, but again, the pain will recur in the night. This frequency can keep varying. It can be uh, sometimes weekly, it can be daily. It can sometimes be uh, uh, very severe. Sometimes it can be mild. The problem comes is when you don't see that nidus very well or the site is atypical. So like this particular X-ray, I can, I can hand it over to the panel to discuss it. You can see that on the left-hand side, there's a thickening of the cortical bone. This was an 11-year-old boy. And he's had this pain for about uh, eight months. He occasionally gets up in the middle of the night, not every day, but occasionally does get up in the middle of the night, but feels pain only when he is uh, active. How do we go about this? Prakash? Where, sir, where is this, does he localize this pain? It's, yes, it's, it's on the thigh. It's on the lateral thigh on the left side. Okay, I can't appreciate much on this, uh, ex except for some robust sclerosis in the left hip around Absolute. the subprochantric region. So that's the only sign which is here is that there is a very thick, there's a thickening. It's an eccentric bony thickening that one can see. Thickening. Yes. Right. Which looks and like, which makes it a chronic process. Yeah, so this was assumed to be a, a tuberculosis. And this patient was actually put on anti-tuberculous treatment to which he didn't respond. He still kept getting the pain. You can probably appreciate that thickening a little better on these x-rays. You can't yes. see much yes. on the x-ray. Yes. But the AP x-ray clearly shows you an eccentric thickening. And, and as a rule, I would say that if you see an eccentric thickening with pain, always think of an osteoid osteoma. And here again, somebody had done an MR. And like I told you, the MR will show uh, a lot of inflammatory changes in the marrow, which you can see here. But 
a CT actually picks up the nidus. So I think the right investigation when you are seeing cortical thickening is not an MRI but a CT. That is the whole uh, message of this. And and the nidus very often will not be seen on a plain X-ray. You are lucky if you see the nidus on a plain X-ray. Some of the nidus are large enough to be seen, but many of these uh, nidus are so small, or the X-ray is not good enough to be able to show you that uh, lytic region clearly. I don't think uh, there is any controversy about the way we would treat this. Anybody would disagree about radio frequency ablation? No, I think no, that would be the know. treatment of that choice. That would be the treatment of choice, yeah. So that's exactly what was done. And the pain relief is actually dramatic. Starts uh, uh, from the uh, very same evening. And that kind of that nagging pain, that waking up in the night is, is almost immediately gone. Now, this uh, is is something which we used to do before we had RFA. I'm just showing these pictures of historic interest. We used to <laughs> wear out the nidus when we didn't have the RFA equipment. So we could we would, we would mill it out. You, Chetan will remember in-, in yeah, I remember very well. <laughs> <laughs> so question but, to you, sir. Question to you, sir, Manisha Karwal, sir. That if, if uh, in, a, in a peripheral center, if such a patient presents and uh, there is no uh, facility of doing a radio frequency ablation. Is this sort of a treatment, a CT guided drilling? Would that still be the treatment of choice? Will that be okay? It's it's okay. You can always justify it, but I think we are we are all. It's an issue of moving ahead. Now you can rent the RFA equipment, and this rental can go on to even small towns. I have friends who in small towns have uh, uh, rented the RFA equipment, and the radiologists have gone ahead and done the RFA there. So I think if you want to do the RFA, you can do it. If you don't want to do it, you can always justify doing something else. No, sir. There is one issue. It is quite expensive. RFA, although, you know, it is sort of a, you know, daycare kind of procedure. Yeah, but Chetan, but... Chetan, again, this expense thing is overrated. If you reuse the needles, which almost everybody does today, we can't yeah. do it at Induja because we are so-called NABH uh, accredited center and we have to use a new needle. But if the same patient gets a, a recurrence, you can reuse the needle and the cost is much lower. So the basic okay. cost in an RFA is actually the rental cost and the cost of the needle. The and needle. if you do surgery, it, it would be the same cost. No, I'm talking about you know, drilling. CT guided drilling. Even if you do a CT guided drilling. Relatively, it will be yeah, cost so, effective. So you do the CT guided drilling, but I'm always scared that it leaves a bigger hole than what the RFA does, and, and it could risk a fracture in the lower limb. Particularly, that's, that's uh, certainly a uh, concern. Yeah. So just to just to play the devil's advocate over here, what if I say that I, I don't get a, a biopsy when I do an RFA or an uh, CT guided drilling? Why not do an open? Uh, excision sort of, and then you'll get material for culture, you'll get material for histopathology. What are your? What is your take on this? My take is I don't uh, take a patient for RFA unless I am very certain from the radiology itself that this is an osteoid osteoma. Now I don't need material for it because the moment I get pain relief, I know that uh, this is a this is like a clear sign that this was an osteoid osteoma. In fact, today even if you do a dynamic contrast MR, you will get that rapid wash in and wash out, which is again something which is diagnostic of. Osteoid osteoma, osteoblastoma, these two lesions. You see a specific pattern in which the contrast is taken in and washed out. So you have many ways to confirm. There are very few rare situations where we still have a differential diagnosis where I'm not certain what it is. And then those are the lesions I would biopsy. I would not go in with a RFA unless I'm quite certain about what the diagnosis is. Okay. So going on to the next case, anybody from the panel? Yeah, there is a uh, uh, eccentric uh, cortical lesion in the distal humeral diaphysis on the medial side, which uh, was painful. there is no history of trauma. Right. Uh, he's tender exactly at the site of the swelling, which you can feel. So what should one do? It's a solid periosteal reaction, you know, all the features of a benign uh, cortical pathology. So definitely a CT. I mean, That's I would suspect based on the history, if the patient typically has night pains, then it is almost clinches the, you know, Absolutely. diagnosis. So this is something which is characteristic and this patient did have that history that he would get up in the middle of the night with pain. Right. 
again though he was an adult he would still get up in the middle of the night with pain and and we were quite so in these cases i think an mr is not required you could straight away go ahead with a ct and if it confirms your diagnosis you actually don't you can save the cost of an mr on that right so here somebody did a bone scan first because i think they were not really sure of what they were seeing because the nidus was not visible you can clearly see the focal hot spot corresponding yeah. to the area which is uh, lesional right. that's the ct and you can see the nidus uh, very clearly so again the basic rule is that if you see an eccentric thickening of bone with pain i think you have to assume this is an osteoid osteoma until proven otherwise and ct is probably the best investigation you don't really need an mri in these yeah. cases now i i'm going to share this case because this is my own case and i think i made a fool of myself on this case now you know this topic is an osteoid osteoma but when this patient came to me i didn't know that so this <laughs> was a 11 year old boy and as it turns out to be in the in the early part of your career your mistake is made only on the case which is high profile this this guy was the son of a maharaja from uh, one of the uh, small provinces of uh, rajasthan and he came with pain and he had some fever and we saw his x rays i don't have the ap x ray we lost it somewhere but it showed just a little periosteal reaction on the tibia now an mr was done for him he it, this was actually done elsewhere he had been seen at a private hospital and then referred to us saying that this could be evings that is what was reported even on the mr that you are seeing a lot of marrow edema you are seeing periosteal reaction and the differential diagnosis was something between osteomyelitis and evings so anybody from the panel well if you see the mri images uh, on the lower side the lower two images uh, we can see that there is one hypotense uh, lesion uh, onto the uh, onto the medial cortex in in the yeah. uh, intracortical yes so that is that is and can you believe it it was missed by the surgeon and the radiologist but it's very very likely but it I mean, is uh, yeah very, very i likely. don't blame them for missing it Absolutely. i think if this patient had a typical complaint of night pain then i would you know definitely consider you know this patient did asthma. night pain did it, but also had day pain <laughs> yeah that's interesting <laughs> because in a, few, day, a few patients do complain of day pain he was as also well. having mild fever right so i think an anterior posterior x ray would have shown that robust sclerosis that we see on the coronal mri on the anterior medial cortex which i think uh, would have been a pointer actually he didn't have much of sclerosis so what we actually did was we did a needle biopsy which was inconclusive and when the needle biopsy was inconclusive uh, we went ahead and did an open biopsy because we thought that we are missing something maybe it's infection maybe it's evings so we need to sample a little more tissue we did an open biopsy and you can see we put in cement there You know, and the moment we finished the biopsy the patient had uh, magical relief of pain and we were wondering whether it is some kind of an infection which was causing a, a pressure within the medullary canal so fine we said okay all is well that aims well the report came as just uh, uh, non specific inflammation in the marrow and nothing nothing contributory from the biopsy so we let this patient go and uh, in four months time he came back he came back with again excruciating pain and this time the pain was not in the tibia the pain was in the leg he complained specifically on the medial side towards probably the navicular bone where he used to have pain he had such severe pain that he would wrap it up in a piece of cloth uh, very tightly and say that that is the only thing which gives him relief and again he would wake up in the middle of the night here again on the x ray except for the fact that he is going into a little valgus i don't think you can really appreciate uh, anything else that is happening no so again i don't see anything on these x rays so we got an mr done again we were still not thinking of an osteoid osteoma at this point of view we we just thought that uh, we are missing something maybe the infection has uh, flared up once again so you can see that cement there and you can still see there is a lot of marrow edema but again at the lower part here now i think it is quite obvious that there is a nidus yeah even on the mr even without a, a ct you can see from the arrows 
Yeah. But, uh, uh, this probably, I think the biopsy uh, uh, took a part of the nidus and that's why the patient got relief initially. But then yeah. uh, it, it's, it's come back. It's recurred and, and the nidus is very much there to be the source of pain. So you can see the CT again confirms that at the lower part of the cement, where we had done the open biopsy, we had this uh, nidus. And now, of course, we went ahead and did the RFA and his foot pain went. So this was actually a referred pain which was going to the foot. So I learned a lot of things on this uh, case. Is is That's why I keep telling you that if you see something which is painful and which which, which has a marrow edema, always think of osteoid osteoma. Don't, don't ever rule out an osteoid osteoma. So in these cases, especially where you are, you know, struggling to localize the pain, a bone scan is an extremely helpful investigation, especially Absolutely. in an osteo osteoma. Especially today, I think you have nailed it. I think you have a SPECT scan, which can actually yeah. give you the cross section and tell you precisely where the uptake is or where the nidus could be. Yeah. Of course, this is, this is the, you can see this is 2002. And we really didn't have a SPECT uh, technician scans in, at that yeah. time. Yeah. And, and the most important thing I'm telling you, I didn't think of it. We were not even thinking of osteo yeah, 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 yeah. On that. Right. But I think this taught me a very important lesson. And ever since I can tell you that I have not missed an osteo after this. <laughs> One is enough in your lifetime to make you feel like a fool. Yes. Very vital lesson. Very yeah. vital lesson. It's always at the cost of reputation that you learn these lessons. <laughs> so you can see that uh, 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 this again, uh, in, the, in 2002, we were only doing uh, uh, this thing, uh, drilling. Drilling. We used to core it out. We used to mill out uh, the nidus and that's what we did here and that relieved the pain. Anybody? I think since you know this is osteoid osteoma, you're not going yeah. to make this. Yeah. But again, this is just to show you that the nidus need not be of a particular shape, size or geometry. You can have a linear long nidus, you can have a circular one, you can have an irregular lobulated one. I think all, all things can, can happen with this. And, and so is the sclerosis. It doesn't have to be uniform. And that, that's what I'm going to show you again. Here you can mm. see that this looks very fuzzy, but this is an osteoid osteoma. And, and so, how to differentiate between an intracortical osteo or a cortical osteomyelitis versus right. an osteo yeah, osteo I mean, when the, when the <laughs> symptomatology is not very classical? Well, you get the blood parameters done. And if you have just focal tenderness, you don't have anything much. If you see here, there is not too much edema in the marrow. Right. And, and the pain was also very focal. The patient had classical swelling, eccentric swelling. He had pain there. And... I look at it in the other ways that so let's say it was a cortical osteomyelitis. I don't lose anything by doing an RFA. If it relieves the patient's pain, then I know this was an osteoid osteoma. Otherwise, you can always, you have all your options still open to you. You're not burning any bridges by doing an RFA. And just to add, the dynamic contrast curves are also very different for osteoid osteoma and infection. Absolutely. So that is yeah, what but... come recently. I didn't have that at this point of time. Correct. So and not everyone does dynamic contrast. Did, actually, most radiologists uh, were not even aware of it. I think Dr. Jankaria made us aware of this. And now, now we are using it as sometimes a diagnostic thing when we are in confusion. Yeah. So here the nidus is much bigger and very easy to see. But actually the bigger the nidus, the more the, the, the difficulty in being certain about what the diagnosis is. Yes. Especially if you have something weird like this, which you can see, it's like a tail hanging down. But this was a osteoid osteoma responded. Oh, anybody wants to take this? <laughs> it looks like a florid I mean, periosteal reaction. Yeah, probably. I mean, I mean, if it was the medullary, I would have called it Brody's abscess. Yeah. Do we have CT scans? Very this? clearly, this is a lytic lesion. You can see here MR. Now you can see the dynamic contrast curves here. Now, so 
these are cases where I don't think we are very certain about what this is. I mean, I cannot be 100% sure this is an osteoid osteoma, though he has pain, he wakes up in the night. But I think once I see these dynamic contrast curves, I think we are far more secure on, on the diagnosis. This is very unusual. Yes, I mean, the whole idea very of this cases yes. is just to show that yeah. uh, osteo osteoma can present in myriad of forms. Right. Now, when it involves the small bones, again, you may not see the classical signs, what we expect to see. You may not see an eccentric thickening. You can actually see a concentric thickening of the bone. You can see a very fuzzy periosteal reaction instead of having a very smooth periosteal reaction, as you can see here. And the MR yeah. can look bizarre. When you look at it, but here again, if you can... Here it is spot on. I mean, yes, the MR you... has picked up the nidus so well. That's because he's picked up these images. That's ah. why. Otherwise, it can become very confusing. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, you, you have to really comb through the whole stack of images to find the two or three which are useful to you. And right. I wish sometimes that the radiologist does that for us and saves us time. Right. So, RFA or excision here, sir? I would do an RFA. I think uh, this is very easy to easy easy access for an RFA. I don't think surgery comes as the first option when you have something simple like an RFA available to you. I mean, just because it is a fibula and it is juicy, it doesn't mean we need to excise it. But I think there is still an option in this particular if case. If you don't have RFA, yes, it's an option. Yeah, but yeah. It's quite straightforward to resect that segment of bone and the matter is closed. It is straightforward for us, but try telling the patient. <laughs> so you probably get different types of patients than us. Well, very ironically, patients who will come to us even in the private setup are coming to a surgeon but don't want surgery. <laughs> but I've just seen that. They are the most happy if you tell them that this can be treated without surgery. Right. I think, sir, we are we are probably running a bit short of time again because Prakash then probably will be uh, hassling to finish his presentation. Can I stop? Uh, can can you move on? To, we can maybe just finish off this one case and then uh, uh, go on okay. to uh, Prakash's presentation. Well, this I am showing you this case because this is what happens very often, as you said, in the periphery. Here you can see a periosteal reaction. You can actually see the layering. I don't know if you can. it is eccentric on the lateral x-ray actually you can appreciate the cortical thickening much better mri shows a diffuse marrow edema so uh, the surgeon assumed this is uh, osteoid osteoma and went ahead and did this excision now obviously this is a big amount of bone which has been removed so he's put him into a cast over a period of time this seems to be healing now uh, a year later, he again seems to have a lytic area and that cortical thickening and the pain has come back. So it looks like he's got a recurrence. He undergoes another surgery at this stage. Once again, things seem to be healing. And then again, pain comes back. And this time, he again see that lytic lesion, which you can see in the area of the thickening. And, and the nidus is still there. Now, I mean, wow. after two open surgeries, you still have the nidus remaining. And that's the biggest problem I think we have of open surgery because it, you may not localize that nidus well. So even if you are planning to do an open surgery, I would tell all our surgeon friends that please get a needle localization done. Put, put, put a needle into the nidus so that you are certain that you have excised it completely. And then the chance of recurrence is not going to happen like in this boy. And then it healed up. You can see that track of RFA and, and it's completely healed up after the RFA. So I think we'll just stop here. I don't think we have time for an osteoblastoma, but those are very, yeah. very rare lesions. And, and if you have to right. skip something, I think we'll skip those. Right. Thank you very much, sir. That was a very interesting uh, session. Uh, we'll uh, move on to uh, Prakash, Dr. Prakash Nayak. Uh, Is that 
At the end of this presentation, we will be having a couple of cases from MOA members who have sent in their PowerPoint presentation. So we will have an uh, expert Am I panel. Yeah, you are Prakash. I'm just making an announcement. Uh, we will be having an, uh, say a presentation by two MOA members after Prakash, Prakash's presentation. And we will have the expert panel comment on uh, the way they have gone about treating their patient. Thank you. Over to you, Prakash. audible yeah yeah your screen has stopped share your screen share has been stopped prakash uh, and you're muted you're muted prakash yeah Okay. Yeah. Is it sharing now? No, no not sharing yet. Oh, okay. I think I lost connection for a bit. Okay. So am I audible now? Yeah, now we can yeah. see and we yeah. can hear you. Super. Okay. So I'll try and make this quick. I'll keep it focused. The goal is to discuss the key decision-making paradigms of chondroblastoma. Um, I'll focus all the energy on one case and try and take us through the uh, decision-making paradigm. So I'll give a brief instruction before we get on to our case. We all know chondrostomas are rare tumors, one to 2% of primary bone tumors, around 10% of benign bone tumors. Importantly, they occur second decade when the patient is skeletally immature. It's more common in the males. It's epiphyseal. And because it's epiphyseal, close to the growth plate in a skeletally immature individual, local recurrence rates, rates can be fairly high. Now, they can occur in most bone body. The three top patients that we need to remember is proximal epiphyseal, proximal humerus, again, epiphyseal, and proximal femur. The three locations in most of us would have cases in these three locations. The common differentials that we look at, they all tend to be see because they're epiphyseal, they're subchondral. Uh, giant cell tumor, chondroblastoma, clear cell chondrosarcoma, they all have C in them. I have primary ABC in yellow because it's not a common differential that we will look at in the epiphyseal location. Now, I'll uh, with the, uh, the first case. This case is purely to enumerate the radiological points that we look for in a chondroblastoma. Uh, and I'd like Rogesh Panchwag to enumerate few key points that we look at on the X-ray and on the MRI for a suspected chondroblastoma. Over to you, Yogesh. Yeah, the key points in a chondroblastoma would be that I'll be uh, looking at an immature skeleton uh, where there is a well-defined lytic lesion with a narrow zone of transition, which is uh, in relation to the growth plate, the epiphyseal, uh, uh, either in the epiphysis or crossing over the growth plate and extending into the uh, metaphyseal region as well. So that is what I'll be probably looking at uh, with no particular matrix that is seen on the X-ray, no periosteal reaction, and most likely would be uh, either centrally or eccentrically located, but with no uh, uh, massive expansion of the bone. So that is what I'll be looking at. It's my uh, sharing is paused, so I will have to... Yeah, you can unshare and then share uh, yeah, again. Yeah, I'll do that again. Just give me a second. So exactly as... Um, one second. Exact mention. We are looking at epiphyseal lesion. That is, is this full now? Yes, it is. Perfect. So exactly as mentioned, uh, it's an epiphyseal lesion. It's usually demarcated. Uh, it may abut the growth plate. And a few key points again, Dr. Panchwag on the MRI. Yes, one of the striking features is a massive edema that we'll be seeing on the MRI scan. Uh, again, a very well-defined demarcated lytic lesion in the epiphysis in relation to the growth plate or maybe even crossing the growth plate. I think you're paused again, Prakash. Uh, I'm Just click I on the slide. You. Tap on the slide and move ahead. Go ahead. 
Yeah, my the slides are moving ahead here. Maybe you want to stop the video, keep the audio on. Um, maybe it's a bandwidth related issue. We ca we can't see the slides being uh, the forwarded. Oh, okay. Can you see them now? No, we are stuck with the X-ray. Oh, okay, okay. Is that okay? Yeah, we can see the MR slide now. I can't see anything. Am I audible now? Yeah, you Dubai, are. I can't see yes. anything. You can't? I hope the rest of the audience are able to see. Yeah, uh, we can see. Right. Yeah, okay. we can see. Can, can I leave and rejoin or something? I don't yes, know. try. Okay, I'll do that. Go ahead, yes, Prakash. Play it. If yeah. it doesn't work, then no, we'll we go into see. format. Yeah, now I'm unable to move my slides. I don't know why this is happening. Uh, just play your slide it, because you have selected one image. That's why you, you have selected the image. Just click on the slide. Click on the slide. No, no, I've, I've clicked on the slide. <clears throat> yeah. Able to see it? Yeah, we are able to yes. see you more. Yes, yes. Now just okay. play the okay. slideshow. Play the slideshow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly as mentioned, the key aspect to be seen here is the robust edema that we see around the lesion, generally out of proportion to what we see compared to the size of the image. Now, this was a PET image taken for one of the patients. This is not a routine part of care for chondroblastoma. We do not need a PET CT scan for chondroblastoma. This was done as a part of a study post RSA. Uh, this shows robust vascularity in this lesion, reinforcing. Prakash, uh, uh, Prakash, I think you will yeah. have to sort of exit the slideshow and maybe we can go on to the uh, view where we will have to select the individual slide or maybe just keep yeah. the. Yeah, oh, I think we okay. should skip the slideshow and see the. Just escape, slide. exit the now slideshow. Is it visible? Yeah, it I'll is visible. It. Okay. You, you can go back to the pet city. Yes. Can you see yeah, it now? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So perfect. So this was a PET CT done as a part of a project where we were doing it to check the adequacy of the RFA in a pilot project just to reinforce the point that it's a very vascular and with a lot of uptake. Uh, and interesting update before we move on to the case uh, that has come up in the last few years is last few years is a specific mutation that has been identified for chondroblastomas, uh, it's very important and very crucial because the mutations are very close to what we see in a giant cell tumor of bone, which explains why both these tumors occur in the epiphyseal region. There's a difference of one amino acid, which makes differentiate as a chondroblastoma, the other as a giant cell tumor, and soon we'll have this as a part of the diagnostic modality in clinic. Moving on to the cell case, this I'm going to focus the energy in the coming next five to seven minutes on this case. Uh, and I want uh, all that, all our panelists to, to go ahead. This is a 13 year old uh, male with a proximal femoral lesion on the right side as seen. And I would like uh, uh, Dr. Chetan Anchin's views on uh, what do you see on this imaging and we'll quickly go on to the MRI. Chetan, can you hear me? Are you there, Chetan? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there is a lytic lesion in the epiphysis of the uh, femoral head on the right side in an immature skeleton. Uh, it's a typical location for you know what we would suspect as a chondroblastoma. It has got benign features with you know almost well-defined sclerotic rim no periosteal reaction, no soft tissue mass, and, you know, can't identify any specific matrix in it. So my suspicion right. in this case would be a chondroblastoma to begin with. Can you see this MRI now? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, so this can. is the coronal and the actual MR. And I really want to focus now, as Dr. Panchwag and Dr. have alluded to, the robust edema that we see here in the neck. Now, this is a precarious location. We know that it is intra-articular, it is close to the fovea, it is covered by cartilage. And these are the further images. 
this is a ct scan of the same individual on the actual showing the focal chondroid matrix again reinforcing that this is likely a chondroblastoma what do we want to do next would you want to biopsy this under cm would you want to do a ct guided biopsy uh, and i want to reinforce that the challenges are this is epiphyseal this is intraarticular close to the growth piece. challenges with visualization so what do you want to do next and i would have this question for dr agarwal so what would your plan be would you want to biopsy this under ct guidance i always will biopsy the lesion but it is always a dilemma how to biopsy in the femoral head because that is where you need a very good reading and a certainty of what it is now you have to plan your approach whether if you are thinking that you are going to do this uh, surgery arthroscopy guided or you are going to do it through the neck then you can biopsy it from the femoral neck through that long track otherwise right. the simplest thing for the radiologist is to just go through the anterior side of the head or the posterior side depending on where the lesion is closer so i right. think you first need to make a plan of where you want to biopsy it from but a lesion of right. this size i i am not comfortable treating this uh, without a biopsy although there are very very characteristic features here that sclerotic rim and the epiphyseal right. location are i actually clinchers to the diagnosis but somehow uh, having burnt my fingers several times i am not willing to take a chance the problem is that uh, as somebody who keeps telling everybody to do a biopsy i cannot afford not to do a biopsy and land up in a soup so i i would Absolutely. have to follow the rules if i expect the others to follow what i say so we would follow so the, the rules and i would do the bars so the measure is no matter how certain we are of the diagnosis of a benign lesion uh, we must plan and biopsy assuming the worst assuming it could be a sarcoma do our plan right biopsy a lesion before we move ahead and as we did we went a ct guided biopsy and Uh, there are two approaches possible here one is through the trochanter laterally and one is anteriorly uh, and based on our suspicion of whether this is malignant or benign the radiologist would choose the approach now my quick question is i want to tackle the elephant in the room now all assuming chondroblastoma we all know is a benign lesion and really there are two big ways out one is surgery and one is radio frequency ablation and radio frequency ablation like for osteoarthritis has come up in a big way for chondroblastomas now over the past close to 15 years since first patient now my question again to dr panchwag and to dr agarwal and i don't know if ashish is around this well, uh, and dr chetan anjan all very much there from the impression yes first impressions looking at these images are you looking at surgery are you looking at radio frequency ablation ashish ashish Pardon. please take that Yes. Uh, no, actually, I'll take later. No problem. Well, if you want my opinion, I, I, for this femoral head lesion, I find surgery is safer. I, okay. I am a little worried about doing RFA because it's a little out of my control. At least right. surgically, I can protect the cartilage. We do a safe surgical dislocation along with the pediatric orthopedic surgeons, extract right. the lesion completely, and and deal with it uh, at that point of time. and we've done a couple okay. of these and with very very good outcomes so i think more and more uh, i'm i'm biased towards surgery for this kind this kind of a lesion but if the okay. lesion is small you know if there's something which is 1 or 1.5 cm and still in the femoral head then i think rfa is a very attractive option okay so the message here seems to be there is a size criteria if the lesion small rfa is good if the lesion is big surgery may be better we are trying to look at evidence on how big is big enough most radio frequency ablation specialists over the last decade are very comfortable with multi prong time ablating as big as 4 or 4.5 cm chondroblastoma so with that information is the background my question to dr gulia and panchwag and dr chetan anjan surgery or rfa i'll take that first because i know yes. what ashish's uh, option would be see the concern is not just the size it's also the how much of a subcortical bone uh, is there and what's the location of the lesion so this particular lesion it's correct directly under the bed bearing area has no subcortical bone support the cartilage uh, might be damaged if you attempt an uh, radio frequency ablation in such a situation i will be uh, in agreement with dr manish agarwal over here and i would prefer doing an uh, open uh, curettage and bone grafting with Excellent. or without a safe surgical dislocation uh, that would depend right 
So I will come to that. So excellent. The message is it's not just the site and the size, but importantly, presence or absence of subchondral bone, if it's in a weight bearing area or not. And these are the three key determinants of determining whether we are going to proceed with RSA or with surgery. Uh, Ashish, would you agree? Any other pointers? Uh, I don't disagree. Uh, I don't agree with the uh, with the opinion that you need to have a very good subchondral bone because uh, okay. chondroblastomas will actually go to the cartilage, and uh, they are they are already located in the subchondral bone, and they are in the epiphysis. So the point which is very important, and in this case, I think I will agree with uh, Dr. Agarwal and Dr. Panchwak that I would prefer to go with open surgery because if you see CT scan, there is indulation of the cartilage already happening in this case. Though Absolutely. So there are a lot of lesions where we have done uh, radio frequency ablation, but 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 in this particular case, if if I could read the Im Im imaging properly, I think the cartilage was already uh, indulated and yeah yeah you yeah, see that and yes yes so I, i'm not sure whether whether uh, doing rfa and burning that area with with 90 degree uh, celsius of temperature is a very good idea so this case may not be a very good case for radio frequency ablation uh, given the size i think we have a lot of experience about do, uh, uh, doing radio frequency ablation for chondroblastomas up to 3.5 centimeters to 4 centimeters and if if it can be safely done without harming the cartilage, it still works very well up to 3.5 to 4 centimeters. So excellent message, despite all the advance, RSA cannot replace surgery in all chondroblastomas is the message. With little subchondral bone, big size, addition of the cartilage, weight area, we may have to choose surgery. Right now, this is one paper which is excellent as a reference for the procedural techniques, the clinical and the MR follow-up of uh, uh, radio frequency ablation in chondroblastoma, and I'd be happy to share this with uh, the whole uh, MOA group. Now, this particular individual, I even have images, had undergone a radio frequency ablation for this particular case. You can also see these signs, which are just in the subchondral area. You can see the break in the articular cartilage right there. This was a post RSA PET stun, which shows complete ablation of the lesion with no activity in that area. This is a follow-up of the same individual at four months. It's already beginning to show some collapse. So the big worry that we have when we are treating proximal femoral blastomas, whether with surgery or with RSA, is one, controlling the disease, two, avoiding avascular necrosis of the head. This is again a post RFA imaging at seven months when the patient continued to have some pain in the hip, 80% lesser than when he had at presentation, which does mean that it is likely not disease related, but perhaps related to avascular necrotic changes that are beginning to happen in the head. So the message is there are limitations. We need validation and we need precaution before we do RFA in all benign lesions, right? Quickly, before I show the outcome of that individual at two years, I want to take Dr. Agarwal's point ahead on the three approaches that we look at when we are dealing with these lesions in the femoral head. The three approaches are one, go through the neck. Two, I mean, core a channel through the neck. Two, make a window, a trapdoor in the neck anteriorly or inferiorly based on where the lesion is. And three, make a trapdoor in the head. That's one, two, three from a beautiful publication which details most of these approaches from various other citations, strong et al. And I would recommend this to be read by most people who want to go through this. So my question to the panelists, I'll begin with Dr. Agarwal who said that he's recently done a few cases of these. So how do you plan your approach? Now the classical approaches that we are looking at is anterior approach, Smith-Peterson, anterolateral approach, Harding or modified Harding, GANs of with a trochanteric osteotomy and safe surgical dislocation and a trap door either in the neck or in the head. Your thought process when we are looking at this case and how would you proceed? Prakash, it's all about the access uh, you require for dealing with that particular lesion. So I yes. think the extent of that lesion within the head is probably what is going to decide what approach I will use. 
Right. And if I can get away by making a trap door in the neck, that's a safer option because it would be Absolutely. minimum damage to the cartilage. Right. Especially if I go from the anterior side, it's a much safer approach than to go from the posterior side. Now, if the right. needle is very large, in, involving a large portion of the head, where I need to reach deep into the head and into the neck, then I think it's a safer option to do a safe surgical dislocation and then right. tackle the whole region because you can you can actually do a good bone grafting and support the uh, subchondral bone so that the uh, collapse can be uh, prevented in these cases. Right. So the key message is if you are able to access it from the neck, avoid or dislocation, make a track in the neck with an anterior approach. If the lesion is predominantly in the head, where we have to dislocate the head, follow the principles of safe surgical dislocation. Now a quick question to Dr. Panchwag and Dr. Gulia. Traditionally, all the other orthopedic surgeon colleagues that have joined us, the, the sense is that safe surgical dis dislocation, we look at the GANS approach. And us oncologists have generally stayed away from the GANS approach because we don't want to do a trochantic osteotomy. We don't want to go posterior because we fear contaminating a bigger field. Your quick thought on if you had this case where you were going to do a, surg a surgical approach, your thoughts on safe surgical dislocation and what would your uh, met chosen method be? Uh, I'll take that first. Uh, in yeah. my uh, yeah. limited experience of only four uh, chondroblastomas in the proximal uh, femur, in the femoral head, we have done RFAs in two and we have done uh, open surgery in two. In both the cases where we did the open surgery, we did not have to do the safe surgical dislocation. We were very happy Great. doing a trapdoor and doing a curettage and uh, bone grafting. So uh, as far as possible, I'll try to do and uh, avoid and safe surgical dislocation, but I will not shy away from doing, uh, doing it if it's required based on the disease extent. Great. And just for technical details, we were supine floppy lateral and doing a modified anterior lateral. Is that correct? I, I, I always prefer the modified anterolateral uh, modification of the Smith person. Okay. I okay. have done, you know, a couple of, uh, in fact, giant cell tumors in the head of the femur, which yes. I feel, you know, the approach would remain the same when you are treating that. I have used right. the GANS approach, but without okay. the trochanteric osteotomy. I okay. just lifted the, you know, vastus uh, lateralis, part of it, part of the right. gluteus maximus, and yeah. lifted the capsule up went to the junction of the head and neck and subluxated the hip without actually dislocating and okay. made an access at the head neck junction and then entered into the head and did all the curettage. You can easily get access practically to the entire head with that and uh, with do grafting. The other Another advantage of this procedure is you can also do your fixation if you have to use an implant with the same right. you know, approach. Right, right. So so in terms of fixation, we are preparing to put in a big graft and use either a DHS or cancellous screws or a combination yes. of the two in trying to complete our procedure. Uh, final question to Dr. Uh, uh, Agarwal and Dr. Gulia. Um, would you agree with what Dr. Anchan said that when possible, even with safe surgical dislocation, we avoid doing the trochanteric osteotomy and take the vastus flap with the gluteus? Well, I think in an adult patient, you may get away because that's the classical Watson-Jones, which we used to use for right. an open reduction of transcervical fractures. But you don't get access deep into the femoral head. Right. That is the problem with that. So if I want a very good access into the femoral head and do the curettage under vision, then I think I need uh, the safe surgical dislocation. Now, I have right. not tried uh, uh, doing this without the trochanteric osteotomy. The okay. couple of cases that we've done have been kids and, and we have used the osteotomy. And I okay. have followed them up because I was also very skeptical about what would happen to their growth and what happens. And, and their function is fantastic even at the end of the The, the okay. trochanter heals very well and, and we've had even some growth coming from the uh, greater trochanter. So I think if done well, Great. I think it's 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 a pretty safe approach, and and I think you should involve somebody who's done it very frequently because they are very good at doing it without causing additional trauma that we are scared of. Absolutely. Just to add a point and get Dr. Gulia's opinion because I'm sure my experience and I recall a couple of recent cases that he had done too, where uh, this uh, image that I've taken from the first publication that looked at a tractor in the head 
a very effective approach where they detach the ligamentum teres and use that as a flap to cover the trapdoor that's made in the head it's something that could be useful in a lot of uh, defects that we create in the head which are not very big um and uh, a quick uh, comment from dr gulia on once we have created these defects you want to pack this pack with some uh, graft either autograft or allograft what's your quick thought on deciding are you going to choose graft you, you choose allograft and what specific cases would you use a muscle pedicle graft thanks prakash so uh, for me i think if as far as approach goes i i i use modified anterolateral approach or in a few cases i have done smith peterson approach as well i think the crux depends upon as dr agrawal said the location of the lesion and the size of the lesion which determines what is the extent of the curettage which has to address that so i think that is extremely important you can definitely keep the patient in figure of 4 and you can expose the entire anterior part of the neck and for me the trap door through the neck has served in most of the patients and has worked very well um there ha- um, in most of my cases i have not used uh, muscle pedicle uh, grafts but except for a few but in most of the other patients we we have used uh, uh, allo grafts and they have uh, done pretty good Uh, also it depends because we are discussing chondroblastomas and similarly we can have giant cell rich uh, giant cell tumors as well which are again a big challenge in this location because with chondroblastoma you have some sclerosis of the bone happening and the strength of the bone is still okay but in gct you may have a very very weak bone and and there you m- might use some uh, fibular struts as well for the support so this is how i i take the call thank you i'm going to end because i'm i'm cognizant i'm short of time i'm going to end with two quick slides this is a follow up at 26 months of the same individual who had the rfa who had disease control but has a complete uh, necrosis of the head and will await uh, a hip replacement of some sort and a quick uh, rebuttal that i want to give about the care that we need to take uh, in terms of radio frequency ablation is although it's accessible at most sites on the top right is an acromion left is the humerus uh, bottom is uh, the femur this was one specific case where despite the lesion and despite the disease control the radio frequency ablation importantly also ended up creating or burning a segment of the growth plate resulting in a deformity in the proximal tibia in one last slide where this was a classic case a 9 year old boy presenting with exactly similar symptom uh, the imaging was thought to be of chondroblastoma reported to be of chondroblastoma robust edema extending all around as you can see in this image even across the metaphysis planned for a ct guided biopsy followed by an rfa now right at the junction of doing the ct guided biopsy the first core got very turbid yellow fluid which was very unusual to happen in a chondroblastoma uh, any uh, process for pursuing the rfa was aborted uh, histopathology was sent and without a big surprise as many of us have burnt our fingers this turned out to be tuberculosis right so tuberculosis in our country can mimic anything so this was again a classic epiphyseal location in a young kid where most of us were very confident this is a, a chondroblastoma but the culture report showed that this is necrotizing granulomatous inflammation so it always always helps to reinforce as dr agarwal already mentioned to never assume to do a ct guided biopsy to confirm the pathology and not jump to wanting to do this in a single uh, setting and to conclude surgery over rfa is for large lesions interfered lesions recurrent lesions or troublesome lesions like uh, i just presented so to recapitulate uh, chondroblastomas occur in the skeletally immature they occur in the epiphysis they are around joints and growth plates approach to them is very difficult the top three sites are tibia humerus and the proximal femur proximal femur is a very challenging location both for biopsy and for treatment we already discussed how if it's in the weight bearing area with the subchondral bone absent or undulating you must think hard if you want to proceed with rfa versus surgery and if you are going to do surgery you have discussed all the three approaches with or without a safe surgical dislocation 
with or without a cone graph. I think I'll stop there in in uh, in the interest of time. Thank you very much, Prakash. Uh, interesting cases and interesting discussion indeed. And uh, without uh, wasting uh, much of time, we will quickly move ahead with the presentations. Couple of presentations from MOA members. First is uh, by Dr. Vinod Jain from Jalgaon. Uh, Dr. Vinod Jain, can you please uh, share your case with us? Uh, you will probably get about seven to eight minutes for this presentation, sir. So you can time it accordingly. Uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, I thank you, MOA President Dr. Ajit Singh sir, Dr. Karne sir, Dr. Sham sir, and Dr. Panchok sir and faculty. Uh, I'm presenting unicameral bone cyst. 19-year-old uh, uh, male presented with pain over right arm following history of injury. He had pain and swelling over right arm. Movements were painful. There was no uh, neurovascular deficit study. He had a past history of operated in December 2013 for unicameral bone cyst right humerus. It was treated with curettage and fixation with IM nail. Uh, he presented after injury to his right arm at that time and he was asymptomatically presented with pain over right arm following injury in, uh, in December 2018, uh, October 2018. Uh, it was immediate post-op in 2013. That was the previous rush nailing was done after curettage. And after 2014, he was all right and he didn't turn up for follow-up. Till he presented in October 2018 with a history of trauma and he sustained pain and swelling over right arm. His X-ray showed uh, the cystic lesion in the mid uh, diaphysis with the rush nail in C2. There was expansive lesion in that area with cortical break. Uh, the procedure was done under block and short GA. The implant was extracted out. Thorough curators was done from the bone lesion. Uh, it was uh, fluid filled with multiceptive lesion, which is clear, and then fibular graft was harvested and it is put intramedullary uh, after breaking the all cystic wall on all sides. Then thick rational was passed anteriorly. Good stability was achieved at the post uh, at the operation time. Then second post op X-ray was done in 2018. Uh, then after one month, the X-ray showed good filling up of the cystic area. And uh, now patient is around 22 years old, around, uh, he is doing all the activities. The X-ray showed the, the cystic lesion has healed up well and the fracture is united well on all sides. The rush nail is in C2. Histopathology report suggested was unicameral bone cyst. This was his mobility of the right shoulder and humerus. He can do all the activities. He can drive the bike, a two-wheeler also, four-wheeler also. He can lift the weight also. The discussion has been done, but it is a UBC is usually seen in the long bone proximal location, and malignant transformation is unlikely in this uh, UBC. They are X ray usually is used the centrally located expansive lesion, well defined margin with narrow transition. Uh, can I can I can I uh, uh, bother you for a minute, sir? I'll just uh, instead of going through the uh, going through the specifics again because we have covered them earlier. Uh, let's ask the faculty if they would have treated or approached this case in any other different fashion. Can I ask uh, Chetan to uh, make a comment on how he would have uh, sort of approached this case? You are muted, Chetan. We go back to the recent X-ray. Yes. Before treatment. This is last X-ray means on 13th. No, uh, no, no. Uh, before your treatment. Before my treatment. Yeah. This was in 2014. Yeah. When he came to you with symptoms? No, no. He came first time in the 2013. No, no. I'm talking about now. Yeah, that time. You're, you're, okay, you're talking about now or at that time? No, in general. Even at that time plus now. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. 
see uh, i think uh, you know uh, considering the fact that the lesion is in the diaphysis of a long bone uh, i think this treatment was fairly acceptable to me at that time but i would have preferred probably a rush nail going in from below and avoiding the growth plate at the shoulder and as such if you see this implant you know has a hook which is still outside the bone i don't know how much it has restricted his uh, you know shoulder function at that time uh because he after 2014 he would he didn't turn up for follow up any time till right, 2000 right right it could have been you know sort of after the cyst healed probably would have been removed but yes again the cyst now has here chetan at this particular stage uh, can you go back to that x ray one the one where the cyst recurred sir yeah 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 this is october 2018 yeah this one right 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 well here you know all the options are open honestly speaking here again you could do a you know removal of the nail and uh, probably do a percutaneous uh, scraping and steroid injection but i would still put in an implant in this to you know protect the humerus from uh, fracturing yes okay ashish uh, your thoughts on this one yeah I, i would agree with chetan but you know what uh, dr jain has done is not a bad idea except for the choice of mm. the implant you know putting a nice fibular studs anyways in a patient who had bicortical fracture and who will definitely require something fibular stud itself gives a good uh, uh, strength and maybe fixed with couple of k plus screws hmm. yeah couple of screws or, or or threaded wires can help so that's also a, a good option but but you know we need to decide whether we are treating so the main guiding principles whether conservative percutaneous or surgery in this case when patient already had a recurrent lesion you want to remove this implant you have a fracture which has happened on both the cortices i think it's better to operate Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jain. Thank you for sharing your case with us. We will move on to Dr. Omkar Shinde, who is going to be presenting his case uh, uh, with us. And uh, I would like to have inputs from Dr. Prakash and uh, Dr. Manish Agarwal on uh, that one case. Uh, Dr. Omkar, over to you. Yes, sir. स your yeah, presentation is not visible i i will again share sir yeah okay am i visible now sir uh, oh you will doc your powerpoint will be open just click on that open up the powerpoint presentation and then share that presentation share that screen yeah unshare now open the powerpoint and then yes sir yes on share screen first open the powerpoint yes i have open op opened it sir so now when you click on share screen you can see your powerpoint within the other windows don't share your desktop once you click on share screen the window opens which will also have your powerpoint in there oh, yes sir yes sir yeah now you can see yeah that's right that's seen now yes. uh so uh this is a rare case of multifocal uh, aneurysmal bone cyst an uh, 18 year old female uh, presented to us with uh, inability to walk since last 9 years uh, she had a history of repeated fractures 
of uh, uh, both uh, both her lower limbs which were uh, managed conservatively and uh, they were also get healed on conservative treatment uh, but patient was not able uh, because of uh, severity of pain uh, so due to that pain she was not able to walk she also had a deformity of uh, both the uh, tibias and tenderness uh, was present at the distal end of uh, uh, tibia on both the sides uh, there was also a 30 30 degree of extension lag on uh, right knee with uh, full further flexion this was her pre op clinical photo when she presented to us uh, there was obvious deformity at lower third tibial shaft at, at both the sides and Is the presentation you know, moving sorry to interrupt. it's not moving it's not moving yeah it's you not moving to... omkar yeah yeah keep this keep this uh, format only omkar yes you yes can, yes yeah uh this was her clinical photo when she presented to us uh, there was a obvious deformity noted at lower third tibial shaft on both the sides and uh, on <coughs> doing radiological uh, uh, work up there was a osteoporotic narrowing at uh, upper two third of femur with a broadening and uh, osteoporosis at lower one third at both the sides also on screening both tibia and foot there was a cystic change at the lower end of tibia on both the sides with the multiple uh, septations deformity and uh, obvious uh, visible deformity with a substantial osteoporosis noted at uh, bilateral feet also also there was a pathological fracture noted at the left lower third uh, tibial shaft on doing lab investigation the serum uh, parathyroid hormones were, uh, level were uh, close mm. to the higher range and uh, vitamin d and calcium levels uh, were uh, uh, towards the lower range uh, otherwise the the otherwise the uh, picture was uh, normal uh, yes what could be your diagnosis this is the pre uh, also the uh, screen x-ray screening of skull was also done which uh, detected no any obvious abnormality so from from this clinical radiological uh, uh, presentation what can be the uh, differential uh, diagnosis we can uh, think about yeah prakash this has been presented as a case of multiple aneurysmal bone cyst do, yeah. you, do you concur with that so yeah okay i was just going to ask the same question uh based on what i've seen i'm not sure on what basis we said this was multiple primary primary aneurysmal bone cyst yeah. to me this looks uh, more like a syndromic case uh, even if if you go back to the femur x rays uh, there looks like there's significant dysplasia uh, uh, happening uh, around the growth plates particularly the distal there's r glassing which you wouldn't expect she's got deformity probably for many years if you go back to the tibia x ray uh, had this just been a tibia x ray at birth i would have suspected is this uh, belonging to some spectrum of uh, oft or pseudarthrosis uh, this looks like a uh, so to to make it clear i do not think based on the radiology uh, a neurodermal bone cyst is even a differential that i have i am seeing significant dysplastic changes uh, in the epimetaphyseal uh, regions of both the distal femur the proximal tibia i'm seeing significant notching in the distal femur uh, i see this as a chronic syndromic process i see significant bowing uh, dysplasia of the fibula uh, bilateral deformities uh, to me this is a syndromic case and we need to look at what the primary pathology is i do not think this is secondary to a neoplastic change Uh, at these focal side side want to know what uh, the other panelists think over panelists uh, we, we, we will ask dr manish agarwal about his opinion well if you see yes. the distal femur it's a classical erlenmeyer flask yeah appearance that you see so i think uh, prakash is spot on i don't think this is a multifocal abc but i think this is a syndrome and one has to remember that cystic change can be secondary to a primary pathology within the bone 
so you you can often see multiple cystic lesions with syndromes uh, uh, there are multiple syndromes which could cause these kind of appearances this one does not look like oliers which is quite frequently actually seen by orthopedic surgeons but this one doesn't look like oliers so we we probably need to go back to the atlases and try to find out what kind of dysplasia this is before we really decide about uh, the treatment for this and the, and the distal tibia does look like a classical uh, uh, ckt ckt deformity yeah. or even sometimes you get uh, osteofibrous dysplasia yeah ofd ckt come like this so so i i don't think uh, we should label this as a multifocal abc we have to find out what is the reason why you have so many deformities omkar a quick question did she have any capriole spots or any other features uh, on no, the any no, other sir. obvious clinical findings no sir on general, uh, on clinical examination there was only deformity at distal and her, and her milestones were okay she is otherwise thrived well her growth was okay baby, baby. yes yes sir. her mental mental history and developmental history both were uh, within normal range now you also said is... pth is higher level pth so did you investigate for any parathyroid adenoma i thought of that uh, but yes, 60 sir. to me is too low so pth adenoma would, would make the levels go to thousands 60 well, probably is like a secondary hyperparathyroidism i feel it's a endocrinopathy not just pth uh, yeah, she may yeah. have some pituitary uh, involvement and uh, overall picture is because of uh, endocrinopathy rather than anything else Okay, yeah. Omkar. How how did you how did you proceed further? Actually, sir, we we were also not uh, sure of the uh, yeah, diagnosis on presentation. But uh, yeah. as there was a pathological fracture at left tibial shaft, so uh, we had to operate for that. So, uh, yeah, yes. So for uh, <clears throat> during uh, intra procedure, the distal uh, cystic cavity was uh, thoroughly uh, curated out. and uh, the sample was sent for a histopathological examination and the pathological fracture was uh, stabilized uh, with a uh, tense nail and uh, the void so created was uh, uh, filled with a strut uh, fibular graft uh, from same side and the remaining cavity was packed with a, uh, remaining cavity was packed with a cancerous bone graft harvested from her uh, own father and uh, which was and uh, for uh, deformity correction Uh, Elizaro frame was also uh, put on that side, and <clears throat> on uh, left uh, femur, protective nailing was also done to uh, prevent any pathological uh, fracture uh, in near future. I have one more thought: is that think of a mild uh, form of an osteogenesis imperfecta. I think you need to look yeah. at that. Yeah, yeah. Because the kind of shape of the bones and the, that uh, the cortices is. is quite uh, classical of an osteogenesis imperfecta that you have uh so uh, on uh, histopathological uh, report uh, they mentioned it as a aneurysmal bone cyst with a fracture callus as a multiple reddish brown uh, soft tissue and bony bits were obtained which were sent for uh, histopathological uh, pathological examination so they mentioned that the uh the lesion was uh, composed of large spaces divided by fibrous septi which are lined by focally uh, histiocytes and the septi show reactive osteoid and uh, uh, focal amorphous calcification so they mentioned it as a anterior bone cyst uh, with no evidence of malignancy yeah so omkar never never take only one thing as as the gospel truth you have to put everything together yeah so so yeah. these features is what is the pathologist interpretation because you've not probably told them what what all you are seeing so this could be a secondary cystic change in the bone because of the pathology and what you are seeing from this report is you don't have anything which is clearly neoplastic which which you need to take care of or you need to worry about and i was just thinking omkar this endochondral ossification in metadiaphysis is very common in these metaphyseal dysplastic syndromes which may explain a lot of her deformities or erlenmeyer plaques uh, the notching in the femur so i wonder if uh, you had some thought on looking up these metaphyseal dysplasias which may present this with these yeah unka do you can you share with us the final outcome uh, after your treatment Uh, so at 6 week follow up there was a uh, adequate callus formation with acceptable alignment at uh, left tibial shaft 
which at six month show uh, showed good callus formation with union in acceptable uh, alignment. At nine month, the iliac frame was removed, and uh, these are the X-rays at left femoral shaft and left tibial shaft showing uh, good uh, union in uh, proper alignment. And this this was a <clears throat> clinical photograph at uh, end of uh, nine months. So patient was walking with the uh, help of uh, support and calipers and patient was discharged on request. And she was also advised surgeries on right lower limb in view of her uh, deformity and risk of pathological fracture in near future. But uh, unfortunately patient was uh, lost to follow up and uh, did not again report to us. Okay, thank you very much for sharing this. Uh, as and I agree with the panel that this is probably not a, a multifocal aneurysmal bonuses that we are looking at. Probably a dysplastic syndrome, and maybe you could investigate her further from that point of view. Well, uh, I, we have overshot the time considerably, but I would like to thank every one of you for being a part of this particular uh, session on uh, the tumors yeah. masterclass. Uh, yeah, Ashok, over to you. I think it was really. Uh... Excellent session, especially the discussion points. I don't think it can be found in any textbook or any other, any manual. So great discussion, and uh, I'd like to invite Shinde sir to end the meeting. Over to Shinde sir. Yeah, prior to this I, I, conclusion, I would like to ask one query of mine. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Another patient who is okay. not of benign, but it is a malignant variety. Pathological fracture. <laughs> Can In short, sir, uh, uh, this is a case of a uh, 52-year-old uh, male which uh, presented to us with uh, inability to weight bear on uh, left lower limb uh, with pain at left hip region since last one month. And uh, uh, X-ray was done, uh, which showed some lytic lesion at cervical trochantic uh, uh, junction. And uh, uh, for screening uh, ultrasonic uh, uh, abdomen pelvis, uh, there was a, a lesion in uh, uh, kidneys yes. for which biopsy was done, uh, which pr uh, proved the clear cell renal carcinoma, which was thought to be the uh, primary. And uh, so the PET scan was also performed, uh, which showed, uh, uh, which confirmed secondary at left cervical trochantic region of femur with a pathological fracture. Along with that, there was a, a increased signal at D7 vertebrae also. So uh, keeping in mind the lesion at left uh, hip, what uh, can be the management options uh, with uh, such a large cystic cavity? And what precautions one should take while choosing the implant? So, uh, should we use a surface implant like DHS or uh, intramedullary implant like PFN is preferred? And any tricks for uh, composite fixation and any uh, need for cement or bone graft augmentation if curettage is required? Well, I would ask uh, another question, <laughs> fixation or resection? And uh, I'll request Professor Gulia to take this. Ashish? Yeah, you wish. Yeah. So, can you can you uh, take this particular case? Would, what would be your preferred line of uh, treatment? Hey, can we go back to X-ray, please? Yes, sir. Uh, this was the X-ray, sir. Yeah, and the primary is. I'm sorry, I I just missed it. Uh, renal cell carcinoma. RCC metastasis. Okay. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> we have literature which supports that the lesion which are in the uh, peritrochantric area at the proximal end of the femur, the best modality to treat them is by resection and not by constructing them. Uh, uh, especially in this case, which is RCC, if you plan to do interregional curatage and fixation, you will face two problems. Intraoperatively, it's going to bleed a lot because these are very, very vascular tumor. And later on, if you have to give radiotherapy to control this uh, disease spreading because these patients will have uh, better survival as compared to a uh, lot of very aggressive tumors like CA lung. So these patients tend to live for years. So you want to do a procedure, which is one-time procedure. 
so i think replacing proximal femur will be better option than to uh, sort of trying to reconstruct uh, and doing osteosynthesis okay sir just one thought i wanted to add omkar is you mentioned there was a metastasis at d7 yes uh, sir we should be very careful how big that metastasis is is it uh, going to cause any impending for that paraparesis yes sir yes sir uh, for and uh, yeah, we must embolize yeah. control that man mm -hmm. only then think of a uh, major procedure because it looks like it uh, precarious in the canal yeah actually there are multiple lesions as multiple. you can see on the yeah. mri yeah yeah yeah, yeah. trouble some And so we, another principle okay. while treating metastatic lesion is that you have to see that the patient doesn't need to come back to you for that particular fixation that you are planning to do. So mm -hmm. I agree with Ashish where he says that a resection is a better option, and obviously it is going to be a multidisciplinary team decision regarding to the further management of the primary and the other metastatic lesions as well. Was the hip MRI done? Uh, no, sir. Actually, okay, that would be helpful, you know, in planning what how much bone you need to resect. because that is extremely useful in you know planning what implant you may need to use okay sir so, so i think the principles are very clear you want to do a single operation which is going to last for whatever lifetime the patient has so always err on the side of doing a little more than a little less in terms of fixation always span more bone even if you are fixing span more bone than what you think is necessary you have to assume that this fractures will not heal remember that renal cell carcinoma does not respond to even radiation so were you to fix this this is never going to heal the entire load is always going to be on the implant and that's the reason why we are saying we should be doing a, a resection here and a prosthesis here rather than a fixation with a nail so again yes. very important to involve the oncology team early on in any metastatic disease also remember that this is multiple but if it was a solitary lesion then you have to treat it with a curative intent because they have a much longer survival even with multiple mets the patients with renal cell cancer can live two to three years very comfortably especially with the targeted therapy nowadays so you have to assume that this patient has a decent life span do something which is going to last for that life span and involve the oncology team so that you can you can give them whatever additional adjuvant therapies required at that point of time yes sir thank you sir you know are possible i think it's a great idea to embolize before you operate uh, this area because they likely be very vascular and you can take the opportunity to embolize the vertebral lesion as well okay sir yeah if you, if if you have never been into a metastatic renal cell cancer Mm. then then this is a very dangerous uh, situation as prakash said so even if you are resecting it the vascularity can be so much that it may not be an easy option to do the resection because you will meet multiple thick big feeders around the tumor so uh, so if you have the facilities for embolization that's a, that's a very good option yeah. but let's say if it was not in the neck of the femur and this was in the shaft of the femur then then what are the things that you could do we could be, uh, take discuss that 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 is another option that that is where the nail is something which is a reasonable option you could do a nail with cement but when you curate this either you should have a tourniquet in place or you should have embolized this patient yeah. before you take in for surgery thank you very much sir very valid concluding remarks and i'll ask uh, dr shinde uh, the president of marsha orthopedic association to uh, conclude this session mm -hmm. it was a great experience can you hear me yes yes sir we can it was a great experience we really had a great deal of discussion and sharing of knowledge with recent advances in management of such benign bony tumors by watching i am very much assured that every general orthopedic surgeon like me practicing at periphery also can efficiently manage such cases with online help of you people and produce a successful good result thank you thank you very much all the dignitaries and faculties i would like to convey one message to you people mostly our 
it has been decided on the 19th ioa ec meeting that ioa is postponed ioa 2020 and now it will be held in next year 2021 either october or november next year meanwhile we are going to continue this academic activities openly whenever required and we will continue the same thing there is one request baki uh, chahe from uh, my side those who are from maharashtra please become a moa member as well as io member to make our strong base of association thank you thank you very much thank, thank you sir. thank you sir thank you very much sir